So now it's, uh, we move on and it's my great pleasure to introduce Marc Bagarazzi from Innovio Pharmaceuticals and by this we change the topic to DNA vaccines and it's uh, my pleasure to announce the talk which is entitled Phase 3 Trial for Treatment of Cervical Dysplasia plagia Caused by Human Papilloma Viruses. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you for allowing us to allowing me to speak on our behalf. So, uh, yes, our topic is our phase three study. Um, but as I, uh, I'm going to walk through uh, different aspects that brought us to this phase three study. So, our study is called a randomized evaluation of VGX3100 and electroporation for the treatment of cerv cervical H cell. Uh, we get the reveal uh, one uh, acronym out of that. Uh, very trickily, but it comes out of it. Um, but I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about our platform. So <clears throat> our platform is one, hmm. there you go, hope that doesn't happen the whole time. Uh, we call Aspire, uh, so we're big on acronyms right now, but uh, antigen-specific immune responses immunotherapy platform. So it's basically a DNA vaccine platform which is augmented by uh, an efficacy enhancing uh, device, which uh, uh, electroporation device. So similar to other approaches, we identify um, a target, an antigen of interest that we think and you know, others have also uh, thought would be a very important antigen to induce an immune, immune response to. Uh, but we identify different strains for it, if it's a viral target. And the example I'm going to be talking about is, H, is human papillomavirus. So we look at the gene sequences of various strains, and then we try to optimize a consensus sequence. Uh, and that's where we come up with the, another of our uh, phrases, uh, syncon or synthetic consensus. And then we insert that synthetic consensus sequence into our uh, plasmid backbone, which has been used and has uh, been, uh, been very reliably used and repeatedly. Uh, and then we manufacture that using a, um, uh, our own manufacturing process, and then we deliver our vaccine, our DNA vaccine, uh, into tissue, muscle, or skin mm -hmm. using our efficacy-enabling uh, device, which we call Selectra, and then we generate antibodies, and very more importantly, uh, most importantly, I think, uh, we generate a strong T-cell response to the viral proteins uh, encoded by uh, the DNA sequence that we uh, code for. So our, a little bit about our Selectra device. Uh, this is our uh, most advanced device. And <clears throat> it's a handheld device. And it enables us to deliver DNA. Uh, this one particular device is for intramuscular use. Uh, you can deliver into the deltoid. You can deliver into the thigh. And basically, we this particular device delivers a sequence of three pulses, uh, lasting a few milliseconds. And um, the whole procedure takes less than 10 seconds. And what it does is it just creates uh, transient uh, cell membrane permeability, which allows more DNA, much more DNA to get into the cell, get into the nucleus. Um, and then, of course, better, better getting more DNA in gets improved expression and improved immune responses. So that's demonstrated here uh, in animal experiments. On, uh, on the left, it's basically uh, DNA encoding green fluorescent protein. On the top, you see uh, sections of rabbit muscle that were injected with, with a plasmid uh, without any electroporation. And on the bottom, you see what kind of expression we get of the fluorescent protein when we use the electroporation. And that's also demonstrated on the right, where you can see. Oh, no, that's not working. Do you have a laser pointer here? Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's also demonstrated on the right, where you can see uh, basically, uh, no, okay, it gets a little faded. Without electroporation, you, you do get an immune response, but it's, it's quite modest. With electroporation, you basically have a, uh, 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 a large jump in your immune response. And then what you see here is the differences that we get when we do our different optimization of our plasmids. So the combined effect is. Uh, uh, a large improvement in the immune responses. Uh, so our Selectra device, uh, we have quite a bit of clinical experience with the device. 
the device that I mentioned before, the 5PSP, is the device that we're using in our phase three study. Um, <clears throat> It integrates the drug, a drug delivery with the electroporation delivery, and it's, uh, we can adjust the depth to different muscle depths, uh, and we have experience in you know, uh, getting closer and closer to 2,000 uh, human subjects and uh, almost 6,000 doses right now. So you know, I showed you some comparisons of our platform's effect in animal studies. So many of you in this room and ASGCT has seen a lot of DNA vaccine studies over the years. Um, and, you know, we know that DNA vaccines look very promising in animal studies. Uh, and then in human studies, uh, things have sort of fallen short of expectations. And that's where our <clears throat> selector electroporation device comes in. So this is data from the NIH uh, HIV Vaccine Trials Network their uh, core lab at, um, in Seattle. And what we, this is a um, slide that shows responses to various, um, various platforms, uh, uh, mono platforms and platforms that are co combined uh, prime boost regimens. And at the bottom you can see that with our platform uh, we've seen uh, very uh, very significant uh, immune responses, both CD4 and CD8 in, in, in recipients. And this is with a fairly simple uh, three-dose regimen as compared to some of the uh, vector approaches that have been tried that include uh, single vectors and also prime boost. And then we've subsequently done another study, another study where we've uh, used uh, a four-dose regimen and we were able to uh, get the immune responses up even more. And that was using uh, an intradermal route of uh, delivery uh, and also had very good antibody responses. So this is really the one opportunity we've had to, uh, at least you know, with uh, using the same hands doing the immunology assays, do more or less a head-to-head -head comparison. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the core value of our, of our platform is that we generate, uh, we think we can generate uh, very high T cell responses. <clears throat> uh, we also do res uh, generate B cell responses, but we think the real core value is those T cell responses. Uh, but there are other advantages to our platform. Basically, we can combine multiple different antigens into a single vial uh, rather, uh, rather easily. Of course, since it's just a plasmid, it's non-replicating, non-integrating, and we also don't have any anti-vector responses. So uh, theoretically, at least, we can do unlimited boosting without an anti-vector response. Uh, and we've gotten to the point where we can actually rapidly develop um, our, our products. Uh, in the example of the, of the Zika epidemic, we went from knowledge of the sequence to uh, first patient dosed in about a six months time, which included preclinical studies, it included design, <clears throat> getting through FDA uh, and getting into the clinic. So um, we are able to uh, rapidly implement that, that process. And then um, being DNA and doing really some very straightforward formulation, we actually have a very uh, stable product where at uh, two to eight, we can store for at least three years and, and uh, I'm fairly confident at least to five years we'll, won't be a, uh, any difficulty based on the preliminary data we have. Uh, but we also have uh, the potential for storage at <clears throat> room temperature for at least a year and even several months uh, at uh, higher temperatures like 37. So the particular application for our platform that I'm going to talk to you today about, which has progressed to phase three, uh, is with regard to human papillomavirus and cervical cancer and its <clears throat> precancers. So, uh, obviously, human papillomavirus uh, plays a pivotal role in the development of all uh, cases of cervical cancer, and we also know uh, oropharyngeal cancers as well. Um, uh, cervical cancer itself is the fourth most common cancer in women worldwide. Uh, but we also know that routine screening, at least in the developed world, has been very successful in reducing the incidence of cervical cancer uh, over the past 40 years, <clears throat> which I show here. So this is the tremendous success just through screening uh, from the rates that were seen back in the 70s to the rates that we're, that we're seeing today. Uh, <clears throat> now, I think there was hope that would, there would be more of an inflection point when the prophylactic HPV vaccines were 
um, developed and, and uh, introduced now 12 years ago. Um, and there has been some reduction, but the reduction has been uh, less than what was hoped for. So uh, HPV and cervical cancer is here to stay for the foreseeable future, even in the developed world where there's uh, good access to the prophylactic vaccines. So uh, the other piece about <clears throat> cervical disease, which made this a very attractive target for us, was because of screening, you know, there is the identification of uh, precancerous lesions from low grade to high grade uh, so that when just through uh, standard uh, routine pap smear screening, you can identify women who have, uh, are at high risk for developing invasive disease. And of course, those women uh, are typically treated. Now, the treatment for that Uh, currently is completely surgical, so there's no medical treatment uh, for this high-grade dysplasia. And the various procedures, um, the most common one is called a LEAP, uh, and it's basically an electrical current is, is uh, passed through a wire, and you basically take off the superficial layer of the cervix uh, to grab as much of the dysplasia as you can. Uh, but of course, it's a surgery, and um, it's quite invasive. There are other um, forms of uh, resection, but LEAP has become sort of the standard. So uh, because you are removing somewhat that much tissue, there, there are the usual uh, uh, surgical complications, pain, um, uh, cramping, uh, 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 spotting, uh, black, you know, uh, coffee ground spotting. Uh, but then, more importantly, even other than you know the what you the women experiences for several days, is the potential for uh, loss of reproductive health. So there is def there is uh, good data out there that uh, after leap uh, procedures, uh, there is a higher risk of preterm delivery, uh, premature rupture of membranes, uh, and and similar. And then uh, the disease itself and the surgery also has psychosocial effects. Uh, another element ab about the surgical procedure is that, um, you know, there is significant follow-up that's required, uh, but there also is significant uh, uh, rates of recurrence uh, uh, of the actual disease itself, of the dysplasia, and basically you're cutting out tissue, but you're not doing anything systemically for the HPV infection. Uh, so, with regard to the HPV infection, I think it's uh, fairly uh, well uh, um, recognized that HPV 16 and 18 are the types that cause <clears throat> a, a large uh, proportion of the disease worldwide, uh, 70%. So that's where we've targeted our, our first product. We call it VGX 3100. And this is basically meant to be a non-surgical treatment for this high-grade dysplasia, which normally would only be treated by surgery. Uh, and it's, it's uh, HPV 16 and 18 type specific. We actually use two different plasmids, one for each, and we target the E6 and E7 proteins of HPV. And of course, the mechanism of action is to generate a strong T cell response uh, to the E6 and E7. And of course, it's given intramuscularly, so it's a systemic therapy, uh, and which is, um, gets to the uh, virus itself. So I'm going to just review quickly our phase two study, which was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study, uh, where we assessed the, the effect of uh, VGX 3100. So basically, the, the primary objective of this study was to evaluate whether we could uh, generate a histopathologic response to a three-dose regimen of, of, our, of our product uh, using our electroporation device. What we were looking for is over a nine-month period to see whether we could see histopathologic regression of high-grade dis dysplasia lesions. And of course, and we also were interested in seeing what would happen to the viral infection. And, uh, and then uh, just to be complete, we looked at uh, the women who would have uh, uh, eliminate both the lesions and the virus. So we did a multi-center randomized trial. Uh, the, all the uh, pathology was, uh, was adjudicated and masked. 
Uh, and this was done at uh, 36 centers in seven different countries. The women were 18 to 55, and they all had to have histologically confirmed uh, 16 and 18 disease, uh, and that was uh, obviously high-grade dysplasia. <clears throat> and, you know, there were a few uh, exclusion criteria. Basically, the most important one is you had to be able to visualize the entire lesion. So as I mentioned, it's a three-dose regimen, uh, day, day zero, week four, week 12. And then we followed women out to week 36, 24 weeks after their third dose, which was the primary endpoint time point where we uh, took the histology, and then we followed them for another year. So the primary results are what you see here. Uh, for uh, regression here itself, histopathologic regression, uh, we saw about a 50% rate in the active versus about 30%, and that was statistically significant. Uh, and then for the endpoint of histopathologic regression and viral clearance, the comparison was 40 versus 14%, uh, and that was also significant. And we saw similar results in the per protocol and modified intent to treat. And also importantly, we saw uh, clearance on its own in about 50% versus 25% in the placebo. So, uh, you know, getting at mechanism of action. So we did see very strong uh, T-cell responses by interferon gamma Le spot uh, of the active versus the placebo, and those persisted. Uh, and interestingly, we saw several correlates, uh, but one interesting one was a response to E6 uh, was significantly uh, higher uh, in those who had regression and clearance than the other subjects, in those who were treated with, with VGX3100. And you can see what happens in the tissue here. So this is pre-treatment, um, uh, before treatment with VGX3100, and this is obviously P16 staining for HPV. Uh, the epithelium is basically uh, coated with HPV. Uh, and here you're looking at just CD8 infiltration uh, where you see basically a few cells in the stroma. So week 36 in, this, in a paired sample, you can see here that now the epithelium is not only doesn't have HPV, but it's, it's now a normal epithelium uh, without any dysplasia. Uh, and even 24 weeks after the last dose, you see a strong infiltrate of CD8, not only in the stroma, but also persisting in, in, in the epithelium. Um, so that was in our phase 2B uh, for cervical dysplasia. And we've also seen similar things uh, with our partners at MedImmune looking at uh, individuals with oropharyngeal malignancy, head and neck cancer, uh, where before um, dosing, you can see in paired samples, uh, CD8 infiltrates, infiltrates into a tumor. Um, <clears throat> and then post-tumor, you can see a strong uh, CD8 infiltrate after uh, treatment with VGX3100 and, in addition, uh, an IL-12 plasmid. So really to summarize, um, you know, our treatment with VGX3100 uh, did result in significantly greater regression of the cervical h cell and more viral clearance uh, than our placebo group, and that was statistically significant in this HPV1618 disease. Uh, and unlike uh, the surgical procedures, there's no association with those uh, um, uh, early, early symptoms and as well as uh, we think we'll be able to uh, avoid uh, the issues for reproductive health. So this could potentially be a first-in-class HPV-specific immunotherapy or therapeutic vaccine that does target the underlying cause of high-grade dysplasia and cervical cancer and provides women with the opportunity in the future to, uh, to avoid a surgical procedure uh, and potentially actually eliminate the HPV that's causing their disease and hopefully potentially reduce recurrences of both the disease and infection. So really, uh, just we'll land here. Uh, we are going to be doing two different phase three randomized trials that are very similar to the phase two study that we did. Uh, the major difference would, is that our primary endpoint will be the combination of uh, regression and clearance <clears throat> as opposed to regression on its own. Uh, so the very two very similar studies, uh, they'll be randomized this time two to one uh, with the same regimen and the same primary endpoint at nine months. So uh, with that, hopefully there's time for a couple of questions. So thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mark, for those impressive results. And uh, yes, there is time for discussion. Questions? If not, then I may. You can come to the mic, please. Hi, those were great results. Um, I have a quick question. Are any thoughts of opening this up for moderate dysplasia? I know they're starting to do elite procedures for early on, too. Yeah, so this is, um, so it depends what you mean by moderate, but uh, this is, high grade includes both uh, SYN grade 2 and SYN grade 3, uh, and that's what the current guidelines are for surgery. There's also SYN grade 1, <clears throat> which the current guidelines are to sort of watch and wait. But yeah, we do have some plans to uh, go earlier in disease. Yeah, that's definitely uh, someplace we want to go. Will there be any plans to follow this up with people who may have anal or rectal dysplasia? Uh, yes, actually, uh, we screened our first patients with anal rectal dysplasia this week uh, for uh, an open label study to see what the effects of uh, VJX3100 are in that disease. So we're on it. I have a question concerning the, the expressed antigen. So you, if I understood right, you express E6 and E7. Yeah. So this is an oncogene. So isn't there the danger to yeah, no, I, I cancer somewhere else? Went a little bit faster. I mean, we, we, in, we have mutations at the known uh, oncogenic sites, uh, and it's actually not a wild type. I mean, so there's a mutations, and then separately <clears throat> we line up and get a consensus uh, across multiple strains. So it's, 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 it's not wild type because we make the mutations, but we also, it doesn't represent even a, a known strain. Thanks. So the question about the T cell response, you showed the CD8 infiltration, um, but one would probably expect there would be strong induction of CD4 responses as well. And I know you showed overall that there was a greater T cell response to E6, but did you look at the breakdown of CD4 versus CD8 responses, and was it dominated by one subset versus the other? Yeah, well, I mean, the LE spot, um, you know, really requires both CD4 and CD8. I mean, that's been our primary response. Um, so we've, we've done some uh, flow cytometry looking at separately CD4 and CD8, and we do see CD4 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the other data I showed you um, in, in HIV studies that we've done, the CD4 responses were actually uh, quite a bit higher than the CD8 responses. So, I mean, not, I don't have as much data in the HPV <coughs> example, but for HIV, we see almost 100% of uh, individuals responding with a CD4 response. And then maybe you could just comment on the rationale for including IL-12. I know you, you had it in there. So IL-12, the inclusion is based on years of um, animal study in, uh, you know, looking at that it improved responses in multiple, across multiple studies with multiple antigens. Uh, and again, I didn't show it here, but uh, in, in, those, in the study where we, we did the, um, uh, the comparison of the, of the HIV, <clears throat> which is a, a gag pull and envelope uh, constructs, we did see, um, we had separate groups with IL-12 and without IL-12 and the groups with IL-12 did have better responses. It wasn't statistically significant, it was just a trend, uh, but we did see better responses. One question regarding the uh, contribution of the electroporation to the induction of the immune response. You may can comment? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, uh, fundamental to it is where, you know, uh, when you just inject DNA, most of it stays extracellular, so by get doing some permeabilization, uh, we think we get, uh, we, we know we get much more DNA into the cell with better expression and better immune response. Um, there's also, you know, the element of uh, is it doing some low level, uh, creating some low level inflammation at the site as well. And we think that's probably a factor as well. And what about intradermal versus intramuscular injection? Because this is always also an issue. Yeah, so we've had um, success with both and you know it's a bit of a trade-off where with intramuscular we're allowed we, we can deliver very you know sort of conveniently uh, a full ml of uh, DNA 
but with intradermal, we typically re we've been relying on a Mantu injection of 100 microliters. So it's you know it's a bit of a, a, a dose uh, issue, but uh, I th I think inherently the um, uh, the skin is a more um, immune rich uh, tissue, and even with that 10 to 1, in some of our more recent studies, we're seeing as good if not better both T cell and antibody responses with the intradermal, even though it's uh, one tenth the dose. Any further question? Can you come to, to the mic? Oh, a shout. Yeah, it's, it's ongoing. We're well into it right now. Um, and it will be two separate studies. So, and yeah, we're, we're, we're knee deep in that right now. And uh, it's ongoing uh, at uh, 20 countries around the world. So I don't see any further questions. So thanks again for yep. this impressive results. Great talk.